Welcome to a new episode. Tonight it's about the use of and attainment of different sounds all over the skin and how to hone in on some of them according to what type of tipper end that you're using. So the one I wanted to focus on specifically are the bundle tippers. Now the big three things that matter about the bundle tipper is number one, what's the bundle tipper made out of? This one's made out of poplar. Does it look there? Or maybe bamboo. It's also going to matter about how thick it is, how heavy it is, and the arrangement type. So for example, this first one is a straight up, there we go, solid set of dowels, all set at the same length. And it's very uniform through its construction. Whereas this one, which is made up of dowels of bamboo type, has a hole in it. And it was built purposefully this way so that the ends here will flex and the inner core remains more rigid. So it has a bit of a different sound to it, a little more wispy. Also depends on the thickness and type of it, especially if you're going to go with something a lot less thick. An object that's usually you know, thicker in this case is going to give you a little more wall up, again, depending on what kind of material you use. If you're using walnut dowel, it's going to be a heck of a lot more dense than it is going to be for poplar. But if you're using like a thin poplar, it's not going to have the biggest impact, though it's going to have a very clean sound. Whereas something more like you know, the dowel tipper I typically would use. It's going to have that different sound of where it's more full and round. The empty cord tippers will typically have the weight or some of the weight there to give it the inertia to push into the skin. But at the same time, it's also going to have a bit of lightness and flexibility at the end that gives it a bit of more of a whooshy feeling. The nice thing about tippers that are like this is that they will carry the weight and are very well balanced and easy to use. The other nice thing about it is that you can get that thin sound from a very fat tipper. It's neat that way. If you go very thick dowel types, you're going to get a much more heavy, thonky sort of hit. Like that. And then the last thing that matters is usually dowel tippers will have, in this case I have a piece of elastic band on this homemade one, but they'll be able to move around and give different sounds. As you play them. So if you want a very hard sound, you want to put it near the end. Like that. Straight at the other end, you just get a brushy sound. Like that. It's a bit of a difference. Most cases of what I'm seeing people play around are usually somewhere in the middle, somewhere like that. But much like in the same way that you would learn with any other tipper, you're going to have to look at you know, the drum as a whole and how you're putting your hand on the back and the differences of where you're getting it. So. Some teachers teach it as a triangle. I believe John Joe Kelly uses like a triangle method. It's like saying, you know, here's a triangle. This is what you're going to work with. Because it doesn't matter where you press otherwise, it's all going to be pretty much in there. Your hands are basically moving in that triangle sort of idea. I kind of like to think about it in a very similar way. The effort that you put in from the edge to the center no matter which side of the drum you're on, 
it's going to do the same thing no matter what. The question is if it's comfortable enough to actually do it. Still get that kick sound, doesn't matter where. It's pretty much pretty much the same all the way around. Same idea. So if you're trying to find you know the basics of different sounds, there are three major hits that I know of. Kicks which are normally the toomey full sound, that sound. Flat hits, which are usually hit on a flat section on the hand. Or they sometimes turn into chokes, which is where you have it flat or you're choking a section and playing above it. Like that. Or pings, I like to call them. Pings basically come from a very small point of contact on the drum. And they might. They don't have the tuminess of a kick, and they don't have the dead flatness of a flat hit. They're somewhere in the middle. And what this does is that it allows you to access certain parts in the drum that as the membrane is shaking, that they crisscross over, and these little parts almost act like octaves. You can hear it. Doom, 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 doom. Yeah, that takes some time to actually learning how to get that and nail it. For yourself, though, playing slow to start with. So a nice thing that I like to warm up with is using that sort of triangle area and staying in this major area here. So I like to think of it more like a curve that I'll start from the top and try to get first a few hits in here. I'm going to leave my hand there and then drop it low. So it'll be like that. And how I might want to do it might be in a four count. So one, two, three, four would be one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And try to split them up in creative ways. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Something like that. Once you get that, you're going to start trying to access it slowly, going back and forth. So an extension from the might be. you don't want to hear is this. You want to make sure that you make the same noise every single time. Yeah. Try to find what that second part is. It's almost like a call and answer. Up here, then second call. Or maybe this is easier to do. Like that. So. so in this case, I've chosen a choke and a pop, an open hit, and a flat. What I don't want to hear is this. I want to hear something like that. So as you go slow and work through your patterns, maybe you want to do a jig set. Keep it simple starting off and then worry about it. The important part here is not just the variety of sounds that you can make, but that you know where they are and can come back and forth between them. So if I want to go, if I want to use this, 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 and that, I got to think of something to use for that jig. So maybe I want to start with a flat. Just get comfortable with it.
there are four hits right there that are being hit every single time. You know, if you're someone who is a, and I'm talking specifically with these types of tippers, I'm going to do other videos in the future using different tipper types. When using dowel ended tippers, you have to remember you're hitting with something that's very fat, but you're also hitting with something that's chamfered. This one isn't very chamfered, so it gives me a very sharp sound at the end. I can actually be very delicate with it. I can get a very nice little sound. I can get big sounds out of it. That's easy. But the important thing is that you figure out at what angle the tipper sounds good. So this one has very little chamfer on it. I can almost be perfectly parallel with the skin. Like that. If I angle it too far, I get a scrapey noise. For those of you who've watched my videos before, I regularly switch between this grip here and this grip here. The difference is that the striking angle is like this versus the striking angle is like this. This gives me a very soft, easy to control, full sound. This doesn't. This gives me a much more fast, hard, and ref um, I can react a lot faster with it. But it's a harder, scrapier sound. So somewhere between using this tipper and maybe a drum with a softer skin, which is more forgiving in this case, versus something with a medium skin, which is a little less forgiving, I have to adjust to make sure that I can tune in to what I'm hearing and play well with it. That sort of idea. If I'm swipping out, switching out, rather, to something like this, which is a very thin set of bundles, very tiny bundle. You can hear all the bass is gone. It's all the mids and the highs chirping. And if you're playing something and maybe someone is already attacking the bass, you can continue to attack using the mids and the highs. So a tipper like this might be a better choice, especially if you're trying to hit the pops on the highs. But if you're not trying to hit the pops on the highs, this is going to be a very poor choice. Not only that, well, you may have ease of access to those different areas because it takes up so little space. You're going to lose the projection of sound that's provided with something a lot heavier or bigger. But the bigger tipper like this, and this one again is not very chamfered, Whereas I believe this one is a little bit more. So I get it closer here. Here, I'll bring it over to the dark. There we go. It's been shaved down a little bit more. It's been sanded down a bit more. A strike like that means I can strike much more like this to the skin to about here. And then after that, it gets scrapey. Something like this, I'm going to get close to the skin and it's pretty much going to sound the same no matter how I hit it. The radius of that sanding angle or the chamfered angle is so, you know, much uh, less that it's a much more acute sound no matter, no matter how I turn it or access it. And then again, the same thing will happen depending on what material and how the internal design is. So for those of you out there who have the Seamus of Cain split tippers and they click, there's an example of something that's going to have a completely different feel compared to a tipper made the exact same way, but it's a solid core or maybe a lead core. I know some of them out there, like the Faulkner tippers, some of them you can get with, um, I think it's the Mossy's edition, has a piece of lead shot on either end of it. But if you're going to use something like this, It kind of loses a lot of its low-end fullness, but you get a light wispiness to it. And it's got the oomph there because it has the mass. This is about like about a third more in mass 
than this does. Maybe even half, half, you know, 50% more mass. But it's nowhere near as heavy and massive as this. You know, a very easy to make a big sort of sound on this drum with a very heavy set. So accessing the noises, the sounds, start simple. your hand in one spot. See what the one area does so that you can create zones of playing around. That's above. That's below. That's on. That's in front. That's the front rim. That's a hard one to reach, but it's upper back, kind of around here. Or if you like to cup it, if you can keep it and cup it. Keep your hand in one spot and continue to play. Without having to move it laterally. If you do play laterally, now you're going to find a whole different skill set. This is going to be about chasing tones, and I'm going to talk about that more on tippers, where it actually has more effect. Some of the actually all of the rod tippers that are you know basically dowel types are going to be so precise that you have to watch what you're playing whereas the mallet tippers there are very similar to this they'll have more oomph and more control but it's up to you to sort of figure that out but you will have to learn how to and i'm just gonna you know and if you can see it there wiggling back and forth just above my fingers here right there I'm, in this case, I'm following, I'm doing this as I'm playing, whereas I might be doing up here and going. So what I have is the difference between and, you know, there are, those difference in frequencies matter so very much. If you're a player who plays regularly mic'd into a sound system, you are going to be way more sensitive to this than someone who's playing live without a mic system. So if you're just playing acoustically into a room, the room's going to be that, you know, that, that thing that amplifies, plus, of course, the shape of the drum. But it's up to you to start slow. Keep it simple, mix it up, keep your hand in one place, maybe then start changing positions of the hand. And then eventually get comfortable with following and moving. thing I want to mention before we finish is striking power. If you're striking, I'll put it to you this way, there's a point where you're playing between the skin, the drum, and the tipper, where if you really strike it hard, you're going to create, it's just like in guitar playing, before the advent of distortion and distortion pedals and gain, it would be, it's like turning the volume up to a point where the sound distorts. And when you're playing, there's going to be a point where the sound's going to stop sounding good, or at least it's going to start breaking up. If the point is to break it up, you know, more like that, or a, a really sort of racked hit, you're going to find that by, by, by playing too hard, you might actually sour your sound. In this case, this is the fault of the player. It's hardly the tipper, and it's certainly not the drum. You know, as the player, as the owner, it's up to you to figure out what works with this and your playing style. And if this is no good, then you don't use it. So that's a tough thing. That takes time. That takes quite a bit of time. It takes years. If you go if you play multiple drums, you're going to figure out that some stuff works better on some. 
if you're like John Joe Kelly, for example, who basically plays one type of drum, which is a taped, you know, a fixed head, taped head, more contemporary sort of sound, he basically plays one way across, for the most part, the whole spectrum of drums that you'll see him play live or on an album, for example. Um, for someone like myself or, you know, um, some of you out there who are maybe collectors of these drums, you're going to be playing stuff that's taped, non-taped. Some of you might even play with it out of your body. Many of you are going to be playing like this with it tucked in, and some of you make play where it's really tucked in to get that compressed sound because you're using an untaped head. You're going to find that these locations shift a little bit and that the sounds are going to have to be tuned as you play. So what I would like to do, what I like doing prior to actually recording something or prior to playing live is to have five minutes or 10 minutes alone just to see if I can get the sound I want out of it. So maybe this is not the tipper I'll be using in a particular venue. It's going to be this one instead, something with a bit more oomph to it. Or I might be using this on, say, a thicker skin drum where a heavier dowel might make more sense. And something like this, which will probably just go ping and crack and be way too loud and be maybe not the sound I want. So I want you to take four things away. The first thing is the practice technique of simply leaving your hand somewhere on the drum. Figuring out on how to figure out how to get those sounds regularly struck. Start with two sounds. Do a four count or a jig board. And then throw in a third and then a fourth sound. And try to make it work creatively. And it's going to suck for the first little bit because you, your brain and your body have to make this automatic. And it's just hours and hours of practice will eventually make it automatic. After that, you should be fine. That way you can take what you have here and then apply it to the music. The second thing you want you to take away is be, a, be sensitive to what you play with. This I hardly ever use this tipper for the most part. I only really use it on and off on the great big drum where I get a very tonky, doomy sort of sound out of it but I don't get a very throaty, deep sound of it. I try to play in the treble. I don't even use this really on soft, softer skin drums like my Metloff here. It doesn't seem to work very well. I usually, for the most part, will use this tipper somewhere in the middle, straight up dial, medium weight, and I have it swung for offset. That seems to work with me on almost all drums except the ones that I have that are not taped. You know, the non-taped drums don't seem to work very well with it to my ear, at least to my playing. The third thing, the takeaway, is be accurate. If you're playing, point number one of, of, of going through those exercises is to get you locked into the sounds you, number one, like, number two, can do with skill, and number three, use artistically in a piece. Remember, the Balron's purpose in a piece of music is to play, and I like how Rono Snoody puts it, the shadow part. You're playing the blueprint and you're accenting in the fills and things. That's your purpose when you're playing most of the time. You're an accompaniment instrument, so you got to work with that. Okay? And then the fourth thing to take away is be more intimate with the instrument itself and experiment. If you don't lock in that skill, apply it to the music. You know, be aware of what you're using and you're not in touch with the instrument itself. You're going to be stuck using techniques on one particular instrument that will not work on other instruments. It won't, look, won't work on other Balron skins or taped heads or whatever. It's going to be a mess. If you don't spend time practicing it and at least making those mistakes along the way, you're never going to improve. You know, it's the 10,000 hour rule. You know, do 10,000 hours of anything, you're going to be good at it, whether you like it or not. But you will be able to do it without a second thought, and you will be able to perform it. That allows, you know, that simple thought, that, that, that simple um, access to it. It's been written before that this is the drum set for Celtic music or Irish music, or however it's written. I like to think of that as kind of true. You're not quite as, as diverse and varied, but you do have the kick, 
There's your kick, the bass, toms, snare, things like that, and rims. All that stuff is there. It's up to you to figure it out. Um, it will take time, it will take energy, and it will take hours and hours and hours of practice, but it is something you can do. And one of the best things that this little cycle of exercises helps you with is that it figure out, it helps you figure out, pardon me, what works. There's a reason why I use this tipper more than any other tipper in my collection. There's a reason why I barely use this really thick one. And there's a reason why I don't even use this one anymore. So it's because I've spent the time with it and it works. I'll, I'll never bring this one out to play in a session. So hopefully this helps in the explanation, like a part one type of thing of tipper exercises and localizing. You know, going over the basics of something like a tipper like this, going through that sort of setup of how it works, and then sort of a philosophy and application to use it in the music. So I hope this helps. I know that you're all locked up in your homes. Um, be good to each other. Be good to the people out there. If you're shopping, be good to the clerks. They've had hellish days in the last few weeks. Um, try to take life a little slower and try to enjoy it the best way you can. Hopefully you get your practice in if there's nothing else to do. So until next time, have a good week. Stay safe. Stay healthy.